In this lesson, I'm going to make a glaze from a feldspar. We'll discuss using target formulas, feldspar chemistry, thermal expansion, supplying oxides to a formula from a material, getting detailed material and oxide information at digitalfire.com, and oxide and material level thinking that technicians employ to make formulation decisions. Let's focus on the formula list and calculated items list in the recipe window. Engineers have long studied formulas and their relationships to melting temperature, hardness, thermal expansion, gloss, resistance to leaching, color, etc. This knowledge is well documented today. We can use insight as kind of a crystal ball into the way glazes will fire in the kiln because of this. But insight does not think for us. It does the conversion from recipe to formula and back. We still need to interpret these numbers. What should the oxide amounts be? Which oxide should or should not be there? How do they interact? We will answer these questions. Let's get started on answering these questions by continuing from Lesson 1A. If specific oxides and oxide groups contribute specific properties to a fired glaze, it follows that the amounts of each need to fall within certain ranges to get a workable glaze. Target or limit formulas basically show us these ranges. I can open one to compare side by side with these formulas by clicking here. The recipe database window appears. Insight has searched the database for recipes having the word target in the code number. I can do this any time within this dialog also by clicking here. I have selected the Green and Cooper Cone 6 item and will click Open. Before continuing, remember you need to have the Lessons Materials database selected here or your numbers will not match mine. The target formula has appeared in column 3 in the formula list. I've increased the width and height of the entire window and adjusted the column widths of the formula list to display the target and two formulas properly. You can learn more about limit and target formulas at digitalfire.com if you like. I'm also going to click the KNAO checkbox. This will combine the amounts of K2O and Na2O since these oxides have similar contributions and almost all raw materials that source one also source the other. Notice the K2O and Na2O totals are now combined. By comparing the formulas of the two feldspars with this target, it is evident that feldspar as a glaze is lacking CaO, among other things, and has way too much KNAO. Almost all stoneware glazes have much more CaO than K2O, Na2O, to achieve hardness and resistance to leaching but especially for resistance to crazing. How could I know that? I'll double click on the CAO line. The oxide dialog appears. Now I'll click the info button. My web browser opens at a page at, digi at the Digital Fire Reference Database website that tells me all about CAO and what it does in glazes and how it predominates as a flux in stoneware glazes and why. Notice also the expansion for theoretical potash feldspar in column 1 of the calculated items list. This is really high. I use the Insight standard set of thermal expansion numbers and over the years I've found that common stoneware glazes need to be below about 7.5 to avoid crazing. Of course your, your circumstances might be different, especially the clay bodies you use. As an experiment, try making a glaze from pure feldspar and fire it on a sample at cone 8 or 10 and be ready for the worst crazing you ever saw. Let me show you something else in the oxides dialog. I'll double click on the CAO line again. The oxides dialog appears again. Notice the thermal expansion of CAO. It's 0.148. What does this number mean? Well, you don't really need to worry about it yet. Just consider its relative magnitude. Higher numbers mean crazing. Very low ones mean that a glaze could shiver.
Crazing is where the glaze is stretched on the wear and forms a network of cracks. Shivering is where it is compressed onto the wear so much that it flakes off edges to relieve the stress. Now I'll click on the SiO2. This is more than four times lower. And alumina? It is more than twice as low as CaO. But now look at Na2O. It's more than twice as much as CaO, the highest of any oxide. So in a relative sense, CaO is a low expansion flux compared to sodium. Potassium is also really high. That is why high feldspar glazes often craze. They contain a lot of sodium and potassium. The major raw sources of CaO in stoneware glazes are calcium carbonate and wollastonite. At low temperatures, Gersley borate and Fritz are used. How do I know that? It was near the bottom of that web page that Inside showed me a minute ago. We can see other materials that source a lot of CaO here. One of note is dolomite. I will now add calcium carbonate or whiting to the custard feldspar to bring it closer to being a glaze. Calcium carbonate and wollastonite have different advantages and disadvantages as sources of CaO. What are they? I have chosen Edit Materials in Insight's Utility menu, and the Materials dialog has displayed. I've clicked the list of materials and pressed the W key. That took me to whiting. Now I'll click the Info button. Insight has opened to a page about calcium carbonate, which is whiting of course, at the Digital Fire Reference Library. There is a link to wollastonite also and also to thousands of other materials right here. Now back to the recipe window. I've selected recipe 1 and clicked the potash feldspar line and keyed whiting into the materials lookup in place of potash feldspar and 10 into the amount. And now I'll click update. However the recipe still says potash feldspar. This is because the line label was not changed. Insight only uses the materials lookup to find the chemistry. It displays the line label in recipes. When you create a new line, Insight automatically fills in the empty line label if not supplied. So to fix it, I will remove the potash feldspar line label and click, up, click the update button. Insight will then copy whiting from the materials lookup into it. To learn more about the purpose and interplay between the label and lookup blanks, see Lesson 1A. Now I've clicked on the Custer Feldspar line, made sure Recipe 1 was selected, and entered 49 for the amount and updated. Then I press the up arrow key to move the line cursor back up to line 2. The formula list shows Feldspar by itself on the right and the Whiting Feldspar combo on the left. With the whiting addition, feldspar is now very similar to the target formula. The silica, alumina, and po sodium potassium are less than half of what they were, and the CaO now dominates the fluxes, which are marked with asterisks. As you will see, in glaze chemistry, we see materials as sources of oxides. Could this two-material glaze work on stoneware at cone 10? Yes, at least it would melt very well. How about cone 6? No. A glaze with this high alumina needs a melter more powerful than CaO. For example, boron from a frit. In addition, the thermal expansion is still much too high and crazing is virtually certain. The KNaO is way too high. Also, this two material glaze has no kaolin or ball clay. That means it will immediately settle in the bucket and powder on drying. Clay is a perfect substitute for feldspar here because it also contributes lots of alumina and silica, but not the expansion increasing effect of KNAO. I will leave it to you to finish this. As you can imagine, doing all of this without insight would be difficult indeed. The process of turning pure feldspar into a workable glaze in insight is a fascinating 
an educational one. As you can see, you need to think on both the oxide and material levels. What do I mean by that? The formula determines the way the glaze fires. The recipe determines the way it performs in production of the ware. A third level is the mineralogy of the materials, understanding why they exhibit the physical properties they do. Thus, chemistry is an important but not the only piece of the puzzle of understanding glazes. That is the end.